I usually enjoy environmental effects in D&D. It adds variety to each game session, and it keeps the players on their toes. For instance, when I run a game in Barovia, I have players roll a d6 every new game day, as long as Strahd is in power. And then they get a penalty to the corresponding attribute during that gameplay. So if they roll a 1, then they get a penalty to strength, 2, a penalty to, to dex, and so on. It makes the environment oppressive. It changes up how well their character performs from game session to game session, and it gives the monsters a different sort of effect. I mean, it makes the monsters either more effective or less effective based on the threat that the monster poses. And it gives urgency to the mission. Depose Strahd if you ever want to play your character at full power again. In AD&D 2nd Edition Dragonlance, there's a similar mechanic for magic. In 5th Edition Dragonlance, there's an attempt to suggest this me mechanic through the Lunar Sorcery subclass. So I sat down with AD&D Dragonlance Adventures source book and the 5th Edition Shadow of the Dragon Queen book and compared the two systems. 5th Edition. In 5th Edition, there's no superclass for magic users. So it's a little bit awkward. The three moons of Kryn only affect the sorcerer class, is the only one that can be affected by the moons of Kryn. Which is weird, because on Kryn, the moons have a huge impact on magic. If you're a wizard or warlock, though, in 5th edition Dragonlance, the moons have no effect on your magic. And even for sorcerers, I mean, this is an option. It's a subclass. You don't have to take it. So possibly in some campaigns, the moons of Kryn have no effect on anything. I feel like that's a pretty big loss to world building because the constellations and the moons of Kryn, they're, they're a really big part of the world. The gods literally dwell up in the stars, a, a little like Nyx in Theros. If, if you look up into the sky and see that a constellation is missing, it's probably because the god is down on Kryn walking around somewhere. The moons are white, red, and black. Not coincidentally, the color of the robes of the Wizards of High Sorcery, or in 5th edition terminology, the Mages of High Sorcery. It's ironic that they, they are called the Mages of High Sorcery in 5th edition because, as I've said, no matter what your class in 2nd edition, the moons would affect your magic. Whereas in 5th edition, it only affects your class if you're specifically a sorcerer. The Lunar Sorcery subclass functions as a hot swappable group of spells. It's a pretty cool mechanic. When there's a full moon, for instance, you get one, one set of spells. When there's a crescent moon, you get a different set of spells. When there's a new moon, you get another set of spells. As a group, depending on your level, you get these spells. So a sorcerer can swap out spells with this subclass, and that does seem like a lot of fun to me. Now, unfortunately... It's up to the player to decide the phase of the moon on any given day. That seems odd to me because it can mean that a moon just never changes for like a whole campaign. Or a moon could go from full to new to crescent within a matter of literally three days. It's also strange that there's no distinction of which moon you're drawing power from. All of the moons provide the same benefits, I guess? I like the idea of granting groups of spells based on some in-game environmental effect, but why have three moons when they all provide the same effect? Well, luckily AD&D 2nd Edition has a fix for this. This is from the Dragonlance Adventures source book. So first of all, you need to know that Wizards of White Robes of 3rd level or above get their power from the moon Solinari. Wizards of Red Robes of 3rd level or above get their power from Lunatari. Wizards of Black Robes of 3rd level or above get their power from Nuitari. If your moon is in a specific phase, and by your moon I mean the color of your robe, uh, there are some specific effects. So there are four phases to the moons of Kryn. There's Low Sanction, High Sanction, Waning, and Waxing. So if your moon is in Low Sanction, you have a negative one to all saving throws, and you gain one negative one effective level. Okay, I admit I don't think I would implement the negative one effective level. That's too much paperwork for anybody. But a negative one to saving throw and zero additional spells seems fair. 
If your moon is waning, there's no effect. If your moon is waxing, you get one additional spell. That's cool. And then if your moon is in high sanction, then you get a plus one to all your saving throws, a plus, uh, you get two additional spells, and a plus one effective level. Again, I don't think I'd mess around with levels. That's just not worth it. Maybe I would just give, I don't know, advantage to attack spells or something like that. There's also a thing about moon alignment. When two moons are aligned, there are additional effects when there's an alignment. So Solinari with Lunatari. If Solinari and Lunatari, so that's the white and the neutral, the, the white and the red, you get a plus one to saving throws, plus one spell, and plus one effective level. Again, I wouldn't mess around with levels, but I would give some kind of other bonus. And that, that affects people who, you know, both white robe and red robe, robe wizards, or mages, I should say. When Nuitari and Lunatari, so that's the black moon and the red moon, are aligned, then you get plus one saving throw, plus one spell, plus one level. If Solinari and Nuitari are aligned, so that's the white moon and the black moon, then you get a plus one to saving throws. If all three are aligned, you get plus two to saving throws, plus two spells, and a plus one effective level. Now, there was a chart in the book that helped you track the position of the moon. So at the beginning of your campaign, you would roll a d8 and position the moons on the chart. And then every game day, you move the moons and apply any effects or announce any effects. Because you, in this scenario, would be the dungeon master. You are controlling the skies as a dungeon master should. It sounds like a lot of work, but in practice, it just it's just part of good timekeeping, which isn't actually hard. Uh, it probably deserves a video all on its own sometime because I do I do track time in my games and it's super, super easy. And part of that time tracking every so many hours, you know that it's a new game day, your players take a new uh, a long rest and you advance the moons. It, it, it really is. It's not a lot of work at all, especially if you have a chart printed out. If you really want to incorporate the moons of Kryn into your Dragonlance campaign, I, I really strongly think that the second edition AD&D method is the way to go. Try it out for yourself. See how it see how it agrees with your game. Thanks for watching.